Thanks so much for joining us, joining us here on 90s Plus. I'm Chris Bianchi, now joined by Dr. Paul Coley, a 90s health expert for a bit more, specifically on polio. Yes, that polio that we thought was eradicated years and years ago. Well, unfortunately, there have been traces of polio that have been found in wastewater in New York City, as well as traces of it in London and in Jerusalem. It's vital to recognize that with global travel being commonplace, those who are unvaccinated do have a real risk of getting polio. Um, Dr. Coley uh, didn't think here in 2022 we'd be talking about the potential of polio spreading. How is this happening? Why is this happening? And what's going on with this? You know, Chris, my head is spinning because as a medical expert, I have never treated polio in my entire career. And really all of us thought that it was eradicated because we had such a highly effective vaccine. So to see this kind of a resurgence uh, really begs the question of, of if people aren't getting vaccinated for polio. Hmm. And that's really opening the door hmm. for this virus to sort of come back again. As you know, polio has no treatments. And so for us to sort of wake up a sleeping virus like this, just because we aren't getting vaccinated, to me that's a really dangerous game and it should be a wake up call for anyone who hasn't been vaccinated against polio or kids that haven't been to go and immediately get vaccinated. Do we have an idea about what percentage of the population is vaccinated against polio? You know, for a lot of schools, it's a requirement okay. to get into school. So we're hoping that it's a pretty high proportion. But as we know, there are a lot of parents that homeschool their kids or choose not to vaccinate their kids. Um, and that's been a trend that's been growing recently uh, over the last decade or so. And, and especially now on the heels of the COVID-19 pandemic, there is a little bit of a vaccine fatigue that persists amongst adults and even amongst parents deciding to vaccinate their children. So I fear that this this trend of not vaccinating our children against diseases that we know, you know, that they can contract and can be eradicated is growing over time. Goodness. Um, with that said, very basic question here. Um, how does polio spread? Yeah, so, so polio is a virus, okay. um, and it spreads mainly through something called fecal oral spread. Uh, so that means, uh, you know, contact with contaminated uh, water or wastewater, so sewage, mm. um, and then some potential contact with an oral route. So polio lives essentially in our mouth and our intestines, um, but it gets into the body through the mouth. Um, and so, as an example, let's say you didn't completely wash your hands and then you shook hands with somebody else. If you had polio, shook hands with somebody else and then they ended up touching their mouth. Uh, that could be potentially a way to transmit the virus. It could also be, you know, handling of contaminated wastewater. Uh, it could occur through swimming pools, for example, if there are you know, pieces of feces in there. So there are lots of different ways that it can spread. There's also a secondary way to spread because it's in droplets is through sneezes and coughs. So the usual droplet spread because it lives in our mouth. So if somebody with polio sneezes on you and then, you know, you get a big viral dose basically to your nose and mouth, you can get it. Now, the interesting thing about polio is that the majority of people with polio are asymptomatic. So they may not hmm. even know that they have polio. And it's really those complications of polio that we fear the most and the ability to transmit it. And um, about a quarter of people with polio do end up having symptoms, and those end up being symptoms kind of of a cold, uh, you know, fever, uh, fatigue, and malaise, those types of symptoms. And how often do those symptoms get to the point where uh, people get paralyzed? You think about, for example, I think about uh, Franklin Delano Roosevelt, who is, of course, uh, paralyzed with uh, polio. How often does it get to that level? Uh, it's rare, but it's not as rare as it, it should be for hmm. this virus. And, and to your point, we, we've all seen pictures of people paralyzed. So the complications that polio, the initial infection won't kill you, but it could turn into meningitis, which is an inflammation of the, in the lining around the brain and the, and the spinal cord. And that could lead to neurological complications that could be permanent um, and potentially death. It could turn into, as you said, paralysis in the immediate infectious period where you could, you know, have paralysis, not just of your muscles, but potentially your breathing muscles as well, which could, you know, lead to being dependent on a ventilator, those types of complications. And then the interesting thing with polio is that there's a syndrome called post-polio syndrome, where many years after contracting polio and recovering from it, you can develop paralysis um, and problems with gait, walking, um, those types of things that can occur. How worried are you, based on what you're seeing right now, that this becomes a global pandemic once again? 
You know, I'm not so worried because okay. thankfully most of us are vaccinated. Um, and if, as adults, we've received at least, you know, those three doses that we're supposed to receive. Or as kids, we've received our four doses that's considered fully vaccinated. And that offers a 99% protection against polio infection. Now, if you've been incompletely vaccinated, you're unvaccinated, or you have a high risk of exposure to polio, meaning you're working with polio patients, you've come into contact with somebody with polio, or you know, you're know you handling wastewater that might be contaminated, like in New York City, for example, then I do think it's a good idea to go get a booster to just kind of boost your immune response. Because when we got vaccinated as children and now we're adults, many years have gone by and some of those antibodies could have gone down in the, in the meantime. Is the obvious lesson from this is that everyone needs to be vaccinated against polio? Is that the big takeaway? Yes, and I and I can't believe that we're having this conversation because this is a reflection of uh, of sheer and utter apathy. You know, science has opened the door for us to eradicate this illness, which is terrible and traumatic and has horrible long-term consequences, can even lead to death. And yet we've we've kind of let the virus wake up again because we've decided and chosen not to get vaccinated, not because we don't have the supply of vaccine or access to it. So I really hope that people take this as a real wake up call, that their decision not to vaccinate their child, it, it affects all kinds of things and all kinds of people. And you really want to be careful before you take that kind of a decision lightly. Can I add another takeaway and get your opinion on it? I mean, we always want to wash our hands, but it feels to me between COVID, monkeypox, and now polio that yeah. there's doing the what? You sing the happy birthday song and you for 20 seconds wash your hands. Is extra important now more than ever, perhaps? Very much so. And don't forget the flu. And the flu, and don't yes. forget all the other cold viruses, the adenovirus, oh boy. the rhinovirus, and everything <laughs> else that's going to come this fall. So I think that singing happy birthday twice. Twice. I sing kind of fast. So <laughs> <laughs> mine is twice. And making sure when you wash your hands, you're just not just doing this and sprinkling. You're actually washing both surfaces. You're washing your thumbs you know, um, and then you're drying them thoroughly because wet hands are also a little bit like a magnet and just kind of getting in the habit of that. I think that's one of the positive changes that we've had from the pandemic, um, wearing the mask um, also on planes or in public places. If, if you're comfortable doing that, that's also, I think, very positive thing to protect yourself. Uh, planes and something you specifically cited there, that, that's interesting to me. Uh, could you explain a bit more why wearing masks on planes specifically is the best place to do it? Because uh, Again, transparently, I've heard about how air recycles there a lot. It you know, does. But, but having said that, you're sitting for a long period of time. Okay. Uh, you're in close contact with people who are coming from all over the country and the world who may have had exposure to many others. So contact hmm. tracing, you know, is nearly impossible. Um, and there's a lot of touch surfaces. You're touching your seatbelt. You're touching your tray table. You're touching armrests. You're touching a lot of things that other people have touched in an unfamiliar environment where a lot of people are coming and going. So that is one of the places that I definitely choose to wear my mask um, and even though yes the air is supposed to be recycled and filtered and all of that kind of stuff you know if somebody sitting directly in front of you sneezes and you don't have a mask on by the time four minutes goes by and the air starts to get filtered those droplets will already have aerosolized and spread okay so wash your hands extra extra um, intensely I suppose or extra well <laughs> yes. um, and for the full allotment of time and also of course um, wear a mask on a plane. Dr. Coley, thanks so much for your time here.